being here. Um, it feels kind of weird being up here at the um, lectern when you're all down there in a the circle. I'm a bit jealous. Um, there'll probably be a few people rolling in, but um, we've been talking about the idea of closing the circle if we couldn't fill it, and that is not an issue that we have today, which is amazing. Um, so firstly, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Bidjigal country of the Darug Nation. We are very privileged to have two uh, women that identify as Darug here today who are going to be sharing. So um, I'd just like to extend our thanks and gratitude for the opportunity to meet on their country and um, land that is so important to them. Um, it's such a, an amazing opportunity to um, acknowledge people who are in the room and their ancestors. And so I also extend that same respect to other Aboriginal people who are here today. Um, so we're really privileged to um, be talking about a project that um, won an award last night. Let's give it a round of applause. Achievement, and as you will hear through this presentation, it has been years of work. Um, so the opportunity to celebrate that last night was really um, amazing. Um, so I'm just going to introduce um, the, the speakers that we have here today. Uh, firstly, we have Lauren Harding. She is a social sustainability and stakeholder engagement professional. She specialises in social research and engagement to understand community needs and issues and works collaboratively with project teams to ensure these needs are understood and addressed throughout the project. Lauren has experience working with Indigenous groups across Australia on projects such as culturally significant sites, mine sites and community facility design. Lauren has spent the last six years working closely with the Direct Strategic Management Group, Lancome, and Blacktown City Council to help prepare a plan of management for the Blacktown Native Institution site walking beside the DSMG, or the Direct Strategic Management Group, on this journey is one of the proudest moments of her career. We also have Joel Stella. Uh, he is a community engagement consultant. He works with communities affected by change to involve them in the process to reach more meaningful outcomes. Through this project, Joel built relationships with the Direct community to support them in achieving the official handing over of the site. I have the privilege of working with both um, Joel and Lauren uh, at GHD, and it's been amazing to see the evolution of this project um, through this work. Um, and then we also have Michelle Locke, a Direct woman and DSMG board member. She's a descendant of Maria Locke, the first child enrolled at the Native Institute at Parramatta, which then um, was moved to Blacktown. She is a PhD candidate at UTS, so soon to be doctor, which is exciting. Um, her thesis is on how to include Indigenous knowledges in early childhood education. Uh, we have a doctor in the room, uh, Joanne Ray. She is a direct woman and a DSMG board member. Her mob are connected through the Volumodical country. Uh, she is a, her PhD focused on direct women's stories and perspectives on presences, places and practices on direct neuro country. Her great 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 grandmother was Anne Randall, or is Grand Randall, who was one of the first children placed at the Blacktown Native Institution as a nine year old. You might remember both of these ladies as queen of the dance floor last night. So please join me in welcoming our panel today. Waramai Mitiga, welcome into Darak Nura. Today we're on the lands of the Mitigal clan of the Darak speaking peoples. I'd like to acknowledge elders, past, present, and emerging, and also to welcome people of um, First Nations and Indigenous uh, countries uh, who may be here with, with us today. Uh, I'd like to remember our ancestors um, and recognise that they always have been and always will be caring for country. Did you go on? Pujarik Mura, Urabalami Garam Barok, Diakiora Michelle Lok, Inge Gora Tarugutian, Dijariko Yanajanui Bubu Inkami. Good afternoon and welcome wherever you have travelled from. My name is Michelle Locke. I am a direct woman. Thank you for walking with me and strengthening my spirit. 
Thank you both, that was really beautiful. Uh, so as Ellie said, my name's Lauren and I'm from GHD and I've had the privilege of working with uh, these women and with our client Lancome and some other great um, organisations on this project for about six or so years. Um, I'm going to facilitate a discussion between the four of us um, for the first part of this presentation and really we just wanted to share our journey over those six or so years, um, also what happened previous before we came along and um, yeah just share with you what happened, um, some of our lessons that we learned, um, the successes and uh, some of the things that we found a bit challenging and that we were able to kind of step back at the end and go, okay, well, this is how we can do things differently next time. Um, so you've met Dr. Joe and soon to be Dr. Michelle. <laughs> um, Ellie introduced Joel as well, who is our colleague from GHD. And um, Joel will share a bit, uh, in a, a bit later in the presentation about his role. Um, but I have to say, he was integral to getting the transfer happening off the site, so I really appreciate Joel's role on the project as well. I mentioned our client, Lancome, and uh, we have some responses from our client, Alan Corley, who was the PM. Uh, you would have seen him cutting shapes on the dance floor last <laughs> night after our win. Um, so he couldn't join us on the panel today, but we do have some responses to make sure that Lancome's voice is heard as well, because they were really integral. And I guess they were integral because they owned the site for about 20 years and um, really wanted to make that transfer happen in a really uh, respectful and positive way. The other organisations I just wanted to mention that we'll talk about as we go through are Blacktown City Council and also the Blacktown Arts Centre. Um, so that's owned by City Council and uh, they were really important along with C3 West. So that's a program of the Museum of Contemporary Art and um, there was a really in innovative art program that happened on the site over those uh, years and that was um, really important for helping us engage with communities. So we'll be sharing that as well as we go through. So the topics that we'll be covering are how we co-design the engagement approach with community, uh, the multi-layered and the interactive nature of the engagement process, so what I mentioned about the art program, and as I said, just some of our key learnings and how we think we can apply them to engaging with Indigenous people. Uh, before I start, uh, we've got a, um, a lovely presentation with some video, so we can really share with you what happened. Um, it's just really important to note there's some images of um, community members who unfortunately have now passed on. So there's just some images up there um, of some of the activities that we had on site over the years and we'll be showing you a bit more of that as we go through. So for those of you who aren't from Sydney, um, Blacktown is a local government area out in the western suburbs. It's about 45 minutes more, sometimes depending on traffic, uh, drive from central Sydney. And it's one of, I guess, like a lot of areas in western Sydney, it's undergoing a lot of growth and change. So I've got a video now. Um, Ellie's going to help me play our videos, because technology. And um, this is just a really quick video um, from one of the activities that we had on site and just shows what the site looks like. Um, so it's a big open grassy area bordered by some very main roads. Um, it's also bordered by some housing um, towards the back and there's some big gum trees, I'll actually have another photo, um, some beautiful trees across the site, but there's not a lot of trees. Um, and then you'll also notice, you might be able to see that fenced area. Um, that fence contains the remains of the Blacktown Native Institution. And so with that, I think that's enough from me, setting the context. And I'm just going to ask Joe and Michelle to explain to us why the site is important to them and to Derek people in general. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, yes, the Blacktown Native in 
institution site is um, incredibly significant to Darug community. Um, along with the Parramatta Native Institution, um, under the um, guidance, if that's the correct word, of Governor Macquarie, um, his attempt to so-called civilise um, Darug and other um, First Nations peoples um, was enacted through the site of Parramatta and then um, later through uh, the Blacktown Native Institution site. So the site um, is actually the start of the Stolen Generations, um, which were later um, that the processes and the thinking from these sites were later um, enacted across um, the 20th century, 19th and 20th centuries across Australia. So um, it has local significance to Darug people, but uh, the site also has state and national um, importance, and it's currently on a state historical register, um, and it's in line to become part of the National Heritage um, Register as well. Emotionally, um, the site is incredibly important to us because our ancestors were there. And um, as was mentioned, um, quite a few um, children passed away under the auspices of this so-called civilization process. And so the site is very much a matter of memorial, as well as um, being currently significant. As, um, as we are now, for the first time in 231 years, we have, as Darug community, been returned some country um, across the Sydney area. So um, there's, the ramifications of this are absolutely um, incredible for um, the well-being of community, uh, for the well-being of culture, and for the well-being of um, Nura as country uh, itself. So, um, and we all have our, our personal um, connections to the site, and many of community have had people um, ancestors of the past who were in, in those institutions. So, um, yes, I think that's I'll pass to you now. Yep. <laughs> okay, so everything that Joe said. Um, and in addition to that, I guess for me, it's, it's, it's for all of us, it's personal. For me, it's significant in breaking that silence that um, there are people still exist, that we practice culture, that we might not look like people expect us to look, but we are Aboriginal, we have culture, we have spirit. My grandmother um, wasn't told about her Aboriginality because it was so much shame. And um, she lived long enough to see this almost come to fruition. So this is, for me, part of my accountability of stepping up and giving voices for my ancestors who didn't have those voices and for honouring them for what they went through and <laughs> for what they went through. Um, and it's just been an amazing journey having such amazing support from people to empower us, to have faith that we are capable of doing this, but to also give us the support that we need to be able to achieve it. So I'm not going to waffle anymore. I'll take Joe's. Um, so I should have also mentioned, um, I said before that Alan couldn't join us, um, but we do have some responses from him to some of my questions. And Joel is going to um, pretend to be Lancome and put a Lancome hat on um, when the, time, the questions come up. So the first question to continue kind of explaining about this site and how we became involved. Um, so for Lancome, how did you come to own the site and why did you engage GHD to help prepare a plan of management for the site? Thanks, Lauren. Um, yes, yeah, so these came from Alan, who was a project manager from Mancom. And yes, yeah, so Mancom acquired the site in 1985 and since then they delivered more than 3,000 lots of 
like from around the area in the Oakhurst and Hassel Grove um, suburbs, and that was during the 90s. Um, but during that time, the BNI site always remained um, one parcel of land in the state together. And that was just because the future could not be determined because of the, the cultural significance and the historical significance that that, that land um, had, had with it. So they always knew that it was so important. And over tw the last 20 years or so, Mankill has always been working with the Aboriginal community. And in that time, they, as Joe mentioned, they got the um, state recognition for heritage as an, a site of national significance. Um, Landcorn brought GHD back in, oh, in for the first time in 2013. And so that was to um, manage consultation with the community around developing a plan of management for the site. And back then, before consultation began, um, Landcorn believed that the uh, most appropriate owner of this land was Blacktown City Council, the local council of the area. Uh, throughout the whole process, though, Landcorn knew that um, Having the community involved as part of the process and a strong community acceptance in the outcome was crucial to achieving the most out of the site and to get the full potential out of what this land has. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to now just share a little bit about um, what happened when we were engaged to do the plan of management. And so as Joel said, at this point in time, it was about consulting with uh, the various community members and stakeholders and to um, all around the idea of transferring ownership of this site to Blacktown City Council. So we wanted to share what happened. Um, we started meeting with the different stakeholders and community members one by one. And we did that because we were told that um, there were factions in the community and nobody agreed with each other and if you put them in a room together then everyone would just um, yell and scream and it just wasn't going to work. So we took on that advice and we started talking to everyone individually. <laughs> That's okay. And um, it became pretty clear the message that we heard every time was, why are you talking to us individually? Um, we need to be all together for this site. This site is so important to us. Um, we need to all speak for this site together. So we were like, okay. Um, so we organised a community workshop and we got everyone together in a room in Mount Druitt. And this was in 2013 and um, sat in a circle just like this. And um, very quickly, we had a pretty clear message from community that um, transferring the site to council was not going to be an option. Uh, so Joe was there at that workshop with me. So Joe, do you want to um, maybe explain uh, what that message was and what the suggestion was from Derrick community? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, it was, it was a, a incredibly significant day because um, it allowed community to feel like they could be heard with their various um, perspectives and out of that meeting came the um, determination that we have a working group um, to work towards the return of uh, the land to community and so that was a, a process of self-selection and then with conversations and things like this um, a number of us were, were um, on, you know, not placed, but we self-selected to go onto that um, uh, committee. And um, I think there was about four or five of us to start off with, and then with GHD and um, Carmen from um, uh, Landcom, we became what was known as the Interim Working Group. And it was supported by community. Yeah, yeah. Those people were supported by community. So um, that was the beginning of this journey that was to to walk towards the return of the land. And that process, um, we was um, a starting, a, a renewed starting point um, after fairly significant. Um, uh, 
pauses that had taken place prior to that and where um, things hadn't been achieved earlier. So it was very much the start of a really positive engagement from that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I remember at the time that uh, we weren't expecting that outcome in that workshop um, and it was a very clear message um, that the whole, every, every participant supported it. We're going to set up a working group and we're going to work with Lancom on this um, and we'll self-select. And I just remember at the time that the, um, the council officers in the room and the Lancom officers in the room just seemed very open and willing to very quickly change direction. And, and to work with this group that just came, kind of seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, so I have another question for Lancome, um, <laughs> for Ellen, who's not here. Um, so I suppose the question is, was it, was it challenging for Lancome to change direction so quickly in that, in that forum? So um, what Ellen's told us is that Lancome has always, always known that a, a strong and close working relationship with the community is, is crucial and pivotal to a good outcome for this land. And that's what Lancom has always wanted. Um, and since, since the 19, like mid-90s, since Bangkok started engaging the community, uh, they had, had always been hearing that, that the Darug people did want this land in Darug ownership. But I think this, this workshop, bringing everyone together, the determination that everyone brought, and, um, and also the the commitment to the process to, to making it happen. Uh, Landcom didn't see it as a complete shift in, in the direction, although it was a different outcome. They just saw more as the next steps into getting the, the outcome that they thought was best for the community and for the site. Um, and so Joe, what was your impression of, of the Landcom and the council and the GHD people in the room and, and their reaction, I suppose, to the change in direction? Um, I think as a beginning space, um, we really, well I certainly didn't know <laughs> um, a lot of the history at that particular time, but also um, where this was going to go. However, um, uh, I think it's really important to, to recognise that the spirit of generosity at the table on that day was, was really um, palpable. People were um, Carmen from Landcom at that time. Um, she uh, was extremely open-minded and um, just had a generosity of spirit in the way that she worked with us and the way we could talk. And the same, um, of course, with you. We felt um, that we were being heard and listened to. And but it was the beginning, it was the beginning stage, so, so we had a lot of journeying to do, but we felt that we had made a good start. Yeah, that's my memory. Thank you. So it was around the same time that this interim working group was established in 2013 that um, Blacktown Arts Centre and C3 West, which is the program of the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, they got some really significant funding to do a project um, all about the site and interpreting the site. Um, so I'm hoping Jo and Michelle can tell us a little bit more about that program and, and what it involved. So I think initially and most importantly the um, artist projects were about getting people back onto country, specifically Derek artists but other artists as well, <coughs> to reactivate the site. And it's important to remember that while it's called the Blacktown Native Institute site, this site has a history before colonisation. Women birthed children there, we had culture, we had teaching, it was always a place of learning. And so this artist camp gave us an opportunity to heal the land, to remember what happened there, to remember what happened before colonisation and as a result of colonisation. And it was really that very beginning of something practical I think because it had been so much talking for so long and like Joe just said we just started to feel like actually something might actually really happen this time but having something physically happen on the site where community came and, and camped overnight and we had corroboree and beautiful artworks and language speaking language on country with our feet on the ground that just that really solidified what's happening. Is that right? Is that good? 
when you don't try. <laughs> Uh, well, I have another question before we move on. Um, so, you talked a lot about uh, bringing people onto country and um, participating in different workshops and so on. Um, so, could you maybe, Joe or Michelle, uh, share how those events on site help to facilitate the engagement on the plan of management and the future use of the site? Yes, I'm happy to talk to that. Um, I think um, one of the really uh, powerful things that came about was yes, there was the art and there was the dance and the corroboree and all of this, but it, it enabled relationship building amongst us so that um, we could just yarn, we could just hang out together, you know, and actually in, just share who we are as human beings and then build that. So while we having meetings and we would be focused on um, you know, um, agendas and outcomes for meetings, individual meetings. Um, those times of the artist camps and being out on site enabled us to um, connect with Nura, connect with country um, and um, also, but also to actually just get to know each other and, and um, I think that um, working towards just the relational side is absolutely critical to outcomes um, being fostered that are in everyone's interests. I think it helped us to walk together because for us getting back onto country and, and being able to learn language and, and express all that was so I can't hear it, it was amazing. But for people like Joel and Lauren and Alan to come along and be a part of that, we didn't have to try and put into words how important it was to us. They could feel it. They, they saw it, you know, when someone tells you, I'm really passionate about that, you go, yeah, you don't seem like it. But if you see somebody's passionate and you feel their passion and you experience it, and I think that's what built those trusting relationships because they walked with us. And they listened, and we just—it it, was—it was an active and practical way of of solidifying that trust that we thought, yeah, this is this is a good time. This time it might work, and that just helped to really, I think, um, cement that. Thank you. So we've got some video to show you of um, just some snips of the different activities that happened at these camps, and you'll see some of the artists' programs. Um, but you'll also see some of the discussions that um, were facilitated about the future of the site and what it means to community. So Ellie is going to help me again, please. Thank you. We've been talking about with the plan of management is that we want to move to a forum where the Dory can manage the site. So um, we've talked a bit about the different things that happened in this process, at least the time that I was involved went for about six or so years until we transferred the site back to uh, Derek and DSMG. Um, so we just thought we'd chuck a timeline up there because it is a bit, um, there's a, there was a lot going on over quite some time. Um, and so I thought at this point I'd just throw to Joel and he can maybe talk through some of the stuff that happened um, in the most recent period since 2017 
So up until that point, we did a we did a lot of these artist camps, and we had the interim working group meeting and um, kind of getting our our the plan of management together. Um, and then in 2017, uh, Joel came on board, I think, and Ellen also um, was a recent <laughs> was a recent addition to as the newest. <laughs> the newest project manager from Langcom. Um, so yeah, Joel, if you can maybe talk us through that. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure about that sound was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I got involved in around mid-2017, and uh, as I was saying, so much amazing work had already been done on the side and developing the plan of management. And um, really this was the delivering the plan of management at that stage, and the interim working group that had been meeting for it years already and they had achieved so much and um, I just came and played a small part in um, supporting the work they were already doing and um, to help really start looking at the steps involved to uh, deliver this land transfer. And what I noticed was like a month or two after I got involved, um, Alan came in and this had been going on for such a long time and I think uh, we'll, we'll touch on this um, later on in the presentation but uh, one of the things that made this project so successful was the, the time allowed for this project and the process to be um, <laughs> to be meaningful. Oops, sorry, and uh, to be meaningful and. <laughs> But really that was such a, a key part to allowing um, the, the process and the trust and the relationships to be built to allow this um, land to be transferred in an appropriate way and to have a, the best outcome possible. Um, but, you know, we work in um, a world of budgets and deadlines and, and I'm sure that's the world that we all work in and, and that's a hard thing to negotiate sometimes. So um, a few months after I got involved, Alan, Alan Corley, the project manager from Lancom, came to the group and he really, um, he set the goalposts and he said, he said, he said Lancom wants this land to get back to the Darrow community and, and we think that this, this group, uh, you know, has the right things in place to allow this to happen. Um, but this is the deadline. He put a, a one year, end of the next financial year, for the land to be transferred and these are the things we need in place to, to allow that to happen. The important part, I think, in this process was that Alan didn't, um, he never told the group how to do it, and, this, and uh, yeah, the, the way they wanted to get there was completely up to these guys, and they had complete ownership of that. He just said that this is what we need to let happen, the rest is up to you. And I think that was pretty cool to, um, you know, achieving this outcome in, in you know, the timeframes and the budget that he was running in, but to allow it to happen in a way that was appropriate for the community. So since I got involved, um, that's when really um, you know, the wheels hit the ground and everything started going forward. And um, from then, um, I think some of the most important work was really solidifying the vision for the site and the values that the, the direct strategic management group will, will operate under and how they will manage the site. And having such a strong story and a strong vision was crucial because that allowed people to really 
um, get behind them and believe in the vision and what they wanted to do with the land. So since then, they got pro bono um, support from Gilbert and Turbot lawyers who were crucial in um, setting up a non-for-profit entity to own the land. Um, there was a business case developed for the site um, and a whole bunch of other things really around um, those small bits that Lancom actually needed to get the land back to the Dara community. Thank you. Did you want to add something, Joe? Yeah, uh, um, just to add to what um, Joel was saying, was um, I guess up until that point, it had still been about fighting for the land. And once we had the deadline in place and that we could actually get, oh, this might happen, this is going to happen, we have to actually make this happen in, in you know, that time frame, then our consciousness changed from, from, oh, we have to fight for this and, you know, blah, 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 to actually, okay, okay, how are we going to do this now? And that then meant that we had um, to work through a whole different set of um, thinking and um, and getting it done. Yeah, yeah. So, so that energy and that momentum and everything like that actually um, became really focused at that point. And we moved from the, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So we thought we'd just spend a little bit of time talking about some of the other lessons that we learned in terms of um, engaging with the Darug community and I guess more broadly other Indigenous communities. And so um, as someone who works in the community engagement field, um, I think it's pretty fair to say that any community engagement, uh, it's really important to have trust. Um, but it seems to be particularly important when you engage with um, Aboriginal communities. And so my question to Joe and Michelle is, uh, how do people build trust with Aboriginal communities? Um, I think, first of all, most importantly, is that you know that we know what we want and that we're capable of achieving what we want. So you don't come in with the answers or telling us what we should do. You ask. And key to that is listen. Listen to all those voices and perspectives. And then don't just listen and then come away with your answers. Listen and help us find those answers. We might have some of the answers already, we usually do. But we need help to know how to navigate to get to those points or have resources to be able to do that. We are all, the board are all volunteers, but we're also all parents, teachers, all those things that you all are. And so we all, you know, our meetings were on Sundays. Um, so... I still are. Yes. <laughs> so the key is to listen, first of all. But listen deeply to what people are saying and what they already know, because our journey our, our relatives and, and ancestors before us, they've been fighting for this land for over 30 years. This discussion had been going on and on and on. And for us to get to a point where we thought this might actually really happen, you know, um, so the, that listening thing first and coming in, there are timetables, but coming in knowing that it's not going to happen tomorrow and that we, we need to talk and we need to listen and we need to go away and think about it and we need to come back and talk again. And, and we got stuff done, but we needed, you need that time to process. And for us to build those relationships so we could see that there were a lot of changes of people along the way that started off the program and it was really great and then somebody would change and we would have to start all over again and think, is this person the right person? Can we trust them? So I think listening, taking time, trying not to be in a rush. Well, I know trying not to be in a rush and balance timetables is not. But, but it can be done, We've, we did it. So they will be my key things, yeah. Yes, I think um, privileging relationships is absolutely critical. And um, I think flexibility, um, and if we're stuck with, you know, we seem to have a barrier in front of us, well, okay, how do we walk around that? And that takes time. And so we don't just go, oh my goodness, it's too hard, we can't do it. Um, or whose fault is that? I think, I think there's a whole lot of um, a discourse around um, relationship building uh, that's really important and to move past the narratives of the past, uh, which have been problematic, and to actually say, 
we're all on the same page, we're all going in the same direction, we all want to achieve this, and so how do we get around this blockage? And then everyone's, you know, input, working together. So it's not just one voice, it's, it's a group think. And, um, you know, we just follow from each other's thinking as and who, who can, oh, when it came time for legal support, well, we as a group didn't know, but certainly um, GHD was able to help and, and Landcom were actually able to help to find um, lawyers who could work pro bono for us. Um, all these, it's, it's everyone bringing their strengths together and building so that it's all positive, positive pathway. So flexibility and listening and respecting and relationships. And um, I might just quickly ask Joel, we were talking earlier about some of the conversations you and I have been having with Alan from Lancome and um, he talks a lot about trust and his relationship with DSMG and so I guess the question is um, how important is that relationship between uh, Lancome and DSMG for the outcome? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's huge and that's what Alan has always been reiterating um, that that as you guys mentioned and, and we all know that the trust from the community in in these organisations that we work in and, and in GHD and Lancome was pivotal but Lancom also had to trust the community that um, they're, they're selling a piece of land for one dollar to the Dara community and that they're going to really uh, make the most of this site and not you know, misuse it and that was a huge risk for them. So that trust in the community was a massive thing. Um, from my perspective, what I saw was um, critical to building that trust was that all the players involved, like you were saying, Joe, was, uh, were so committed to the work and to this project and to this vision. And um, you know, we gave up our Sundays every month for years to, to, for this outcome. And, and Alan, who was the project manager from Lancome, uh, he didn't have to be there. He, he could have easily just said, you know, engage GHD, these consultants, they'll go to their community engagement and get me the outcome that I want. But he chose, he, he drove, drove two, two hours every Sunday, one way, two hours back. Um, and came to every single meeting because he really cared in this vision. And I think by him being there and brought along the journey, he really did believe in what you guys were doing. And that was crucial because um, it ended up being that not only did he know that it had to go back to the direct people because that's what the direct people wanted, but he knew that, uh, that to get the full potential of the site and to get as many opportunities as possible from the site, it has to be in direct ownership because the story and the narrative is so powerful and if it goes to one of the other land management bodies like a land council or a, um, a land council or a council, that, that connection and those narratives and the stories weren't there and the reason why Alan knew that is because he was brought along every step of the way. So um, I think that was huge, a huge part of it. Thank you. And so, yeah, I think we could, we'll wrap up soon. Um, there's been a lot of kind of um, themes running through what we've been talking about. And as I said earlier, we've learned a lot of lessons by working on this project and, and with um, the Jarrah community and our client for such a long time. And so I think you've all summed it up really well. It's about trust and I guess how do you build trust? You spend time and it was a long time um, and you get to know the people that you're working with and I think that is also about intent so you know having having the um, interest and in wanting to learn and understand who you're working with and coming with a frame of mind of oh, well, I'm not the expert you're the expert so what can I learn and I think it's about you have that intent if you're, you've got the right people on the project. So we've talked about some of the, the people that were on this project for a long time and or if they came in towards the end, but they were the right people to help keep things <coughs> moving. Yes. Um, yeah, I'd just like to um, offer uh, an idea that we have in community, which um, thanks to Uncle Lex Dad, um, the idea that it what we have is Yanaba Budri Umada, walking with good spirit. And we live that. 
So that when you leave it, it colours Perfect. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so we thought we'd just show the final video, which is just um, a short video from the transfer event. And I guess um, before we all finish up, I'd like to just give uh, Joe and Michelle the last words. And the question I have for both of you is, um, so what's next for DSMG and for the Blacktown Native Institution site? So I think as Joe mentioned before, it's been a really um, big headspace change for us to go from we're fighting for this land, we're fighting for this land, to oh my god we have this land. <laughs> now what do we want to do? And we've always had ideas about what we want to do and one of the key things that community want is that this land needs to be used for education, for educating our children, for educating other people. Um, because like we said before, in Sydney we didn't, we didn't have that space. Direct people in our own country didn't have a place where we could come and see and share and learn and grow. So that's a really important thing. So a cultural centre would be our dream. <laughs> um, and currently we um, we have we have four main project goals, I guess, that are aimed, and we call it caring for country, caring for culture, caring for community, and caring for DCMG, which is the people working on the Sundays doing the work. So caring for country is about hopefully bringing that land back to as close to native as possible, which includes um, cleaning up the waterways with our consultation with Black Town Council, um, planting native plants so that the native animals can come back. We do have, on the night that we had the handover, we had a really big mob of kangaroos arrive just as they were officially handing it back to us. It was like, oh, I just can't believe it. Was really I don't want to cry now. Um, so this is all about connecting to country and caring for country. It can, and caring for culture is our language, our practices, our children. I you know we in one of the artist camps we had children come onto the site and they all um, made a little lanyard and chose the name of an Aboriginal child who was taken to that site and they wrote a story to that child. And they talked about what they want for that child if they could speak to that child today and things that your children said were just like you know, they've got the best ideas really. So our culture, our community, our, our direct community initially, but of course the wider Indigenous community and the wider community of Blacktown and Sydney. So we can share, we always need to walk together to learn. And then of course caring for us, because we need that energy to keep going and to keep thinking big and, and, and make sure that the things that we're doing now, um, while on the site it might look like we're not doing anything physically on the site, but we are. Besides mowing the lawns, <laughs> keeping the snakes down. Um, the thing that's happened in the last 12 months is really crucial is that we're getting all of our policies and practices and constitution and all those legal things in place so that we can be assured in 50, 70, 100 years' time it is still in the hands of the direct people of our children and their children. So. Yeah, I think um, as trustees, and that's what DSMG is, we're trustees, we're land managers, so moving that from fighting for land to managing, managing the land and bringing together, uh, there's so many opportunities that have just already come up in the last 12 months. So one of the opportunities that we have been able to engage with is the Biennale for 2020. And we received the um, funding to um, uh, participate where Nura country, the site, is the artist. So how cool is that? Like 
that is just so wonderful because you know it takes it out of a human centric space which we're all dominated by and and says agency is with Nura, agency is with country caring for country is about caring for the biodiversities and if we see agency within country as our inspiration and as our artist then we're re renegotiating our relationship with other than humans and that is just so cool. you know, yeah. that's that's the potential so 2020 uh biennale um on the site um may sometime we're not quite sure exactly when yet and um international artists darug artists aboriginal artists from other countries here in australia um yeah, it's going to be really amazing. So, you know, it's now. Yeah, yeah. keep an eye out. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We've actually got about 15, 20 minutes for questions, which is amazing. I'm sure you're all pretty inspired and have some questions of the panel. So I'm just going to walk around with this mic. Does anybody have something that they'd like to ask about the process, the project? sharing that story and all the different angles. I was really interested when you said how um, Alan came to all of those meetings and that was, you know, a lot of time and travel. Um, my question is, how much is it about the person of, and I know we should, well, I am, we're talking about a person of Alan, or is it Lancome, and how much is Alan Lancome, and how much is Alan Alan? And, because sometimes you get a great person about a weird organisation, or a weird organisation and a great person, you know. What's the difference? Hello? Sorry. That's an excellent question and I think I think there's two aspects. The aspect is the organisation who actually supported him and he he's integral in that organisation. He knows how it works. He takes back he knew what information they needed, he knew what he had to take back from us to them. So having the organisation is crucial, but I think it comes down to the people in the organisation. We had, like we said before, there were different people who came along at different times, and we were blessed to start off with with um, Carmen um, because she she was totally open minded to start us off. Unfortunately, she couldn't stay um, for whatever reasons. I'm not exactly sure, but um, oh yeah. And, um, but um, we so valued her input as the starting place for us to begin this journey. And then we had other, another um, person who, um, it just didn't work um, in terms of that relational building. And not for any particularly awful reason, there was, you know, nothing. It was just, just the realities of um, commitment and, and what it takes to actually build the trust and build the relationship. And if you were walking, working through a corporate model only, um, well, we'd still be on the journey because it just slowed things down enormously. So um, whatever the reasons that... Um, Lancome, the other person in the middle moved on and then Alan came on and that was the regeneration of the energy, the intent, etc. and that willingness and that commitment to actually not just walk the corporate um, path but to actually engage as human beings with human beings and, get it, and hear the stories and engage with them. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's really about the person. Yeah. It is. And you know, I feel like it's the right person at the right time, from the right place. I mean, when Joel came in, you know, he said he wasn't there for very long. That's okay. 
he didn't he said he hasn't been there for very long but when Joel came on we got this whole new energy again which we all needed some more energy and motive, not motivation but that energy you know and he had answers to things and links to things that we didn't and and he was so committed from the start he was like wow this is an amazing story and this really should go back to you and and just understood where we were coming from because we weren't coming from a corporate position we're coming from a place of healing and memory and ancestors and you know that identity and, and breaking those silences and that very personal which doesn't always match with corporate but he got it like and lauren had got it all along so it is about the people it is um yeah i would say it's from my own perspective as well um with Alan, so he, yeah, he, it was Lancom and he worked within Lancom structure in the organisation, but the whole time it felt like he was on our team. And it was, we all were one team, and the goal was to get this back, and that's how we would win. And that was Alan's goal as well. So, um, yeah, the, the transparency and the intent that he brought to it were, were critical. The honesty, yeah, it was amazing. Um, I'm is just more to say thank you so much for sharing your story and I think you're a very big inspiration um, because you know like as an Aboriginal woman, dairy woman, I'm a native title holder as well but it's so beautiful to hear stories like this because it's just not about you know for us the land like taking the land back it's that spiritual connection it's about honouring our elders and and people from the past, but most of all, yours was so beautiful because you wanted something that is hard to have that conversation and to speak truth. And I think that's why you can see people jumped on board because you you weren't afraid to have that hard conversation. And if anything, I think it, it, it really was inspiring. And and you know, look, you're just too deadly, aren't? <laughs> so keep up with the good work. And it was so beautiful to hear this stuff that happens in the city because like for me I'm a, a little rural country person and, and you don't hear much so I just want to congratulate you and say thank you for sharing your story, it's beautiful. We couldn't have done it without all the other people involved. So they, they, they created a safe place for us to be honest and tell our stories. You know because sometimes you go somewhere and you think I'm not going to go there. People look at me and they don't, they don't assume I'm Aboriginal and sometimes I just go I don't know because I don't want to spend my whole afternoon justifying how could I be original. Mm -hmm. And we never had that. We never we always had that connection, but that truth and that acceptance and that wasn't part of business. Business was this what's business? This is what we want to do. The stories are so important. Let's make this happen. And so, I think that's the most important thing. When you see people who are real, yes. And you have to listen, the real story, yes. Then you'll have success. But when you have people come in um, based on Donna's question or comment, which is amazing, I feel the same way. What are your thoughts or plans around promoting your story amongst the Aboriginal community and wider Australia? Because I think um, everyone here would probably acknowledge it's pretty inspiring and something that should be shared. So have you thought about that, like what it looks like to promote what, what happened in this process? Well, one of the things that we're in the middle of um, establishing at the moment is a website. And I think given the realities of today, technology is a really um, helpful way of communicating um, what we're doing, how we're um, uh, protecting country, caring for it, and um, our programs going forward. Um, so as a communication approach, I think um, using the website is going to be really important. If we, when we get our cultural centre, we don't even have an office to meet at the moment. We've got nothing. So we're, we're going to different people's places and other people's <laughs> GHD <laughs> has helped us uh, occasionally with, with the office space and like this. But eventually when we get the cultural centre, we're really hoping that it'll be, a, a, and it is geographically in the heart of the, the big Sydney, Daragnura um, uh, country, 
and um, and so it's just off the um, M7. Um, it's ha basically halfway between the Sydney CBD and the Blue Mountains. So geographically, it's it's at the heart. Um, Western Sydney has uh, the majority of, I think it's the largest number of Indigenous uh, population in Australia. And so it's, while we're trustees for um, Darug community in this country, uh, we also anticipate it being a centre for um, uh, connecting and, re and connecting with other Aboriginal communities and, and their mobs. Um, through through the centre as well. Yeah. I'll just add that there is already a website um, for the BNI project. Um, so there was a link up on that final slide. So that website was set up by C3 West as part of those artist camps that we talked about. Um, a lot of the video that you saw and the images are all up there. Um, and so that site isn't going anywhere. So if you do want to learn a little bit more about those um, programs, um, you can read about them on, sorry, the artist camps, you can read about them on there. Um, the DSMG website is uh, well underway, in progress, and we're really hoping in the next, um, hopefully by the end of the year, uh, it'll be up and running and, and everything. But we also hope that, um, that which all those knowledges which um, the um, Museum of Contemporary Art has collected as a process of those art, artist camps. Um, the BNI side is very much about creating a keeping place, a keeping place for our knowledges. And as we know, um, there are an enormous number of organisations that have our knowledges. They have, like, there's the National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, there's um, local councils, state um, museums and all these these places. So we're hoping that um, in the future that, that, that um, we can um, be a centralised uh, keeping place. Um, and of course that means schools and all sorts of opportunities um, for education through uh, the existing structures that we've got in place, that are in place that we can um, utilise this. So there's a lot of potential um, and for communicating. Another question. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, back to the, you, you touched on I think it, as part of your presentation, the land itself, was it um, subject to a uh, native title or was it, um, uh, so, but it was recognised as important uh, part of the Aboriginal history and therefore um, yeah. So, um, native title as far as, and I'm not a lawyer so you know, um, bear with me, but um, native title is, comes over land that is not privately owned um, and so while this land was, so Blacktown originally was from colonial times, was the Blacks town and so what happened was that um, the land across the road um, was um, given back, <laughs> not given to, given back to um, Colby and um, Naranginji and um, they were obviously part of the Burubarongo family and Maria Locke, um, direct descendant, um, Michelle's direct descendant. Um, she was the first um, Aboriginal to receive land back and while it was given to her uncle and um, husband I think her husband's name even though it was convict because she was Aboriginal um, and it was given in trust for her family to keep forever and ever but over time because of um, stolen generation policies and because of illnesses in the area like um, tuberculosis some family moved away so the protection board went, oh, they're not using it anymore and took it back. And once it got taken back, then it got sold off. Even though Macquarie had um, written that this was in perpetuity for Derek um, and for the family of um, Maria Locke, um, it, it was taken back and at the, 
and beginning of the night, the, the protection board took it back and then it was sold off and it became various privately held um, enterprises. Yeah, there was a dairy there and all those sorts of things. So there's this from Land Council who said we should have it and they also said that Darren couldn't turn the season. So um, <laughs> but because it wasn't Crown Land, yeah. they couldn't have to bottom land and so it was kind of in our benefit that it went that way <laughs> over time, yeah. Which meant that you could actually own it um, as a as a, a um, piece of land as opposed to my own title, which is not actually ownership. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, in the long run it's I have another question, sorry, but um, how much support, what sort of support did you get from the non-Aboriginal community of the area? Um, uh, and um, I guess how was that sort of, how did, was there a sort of a, a view, um, a sort of a, a consistent view from the uh, broader community? How did that work within the city? How did you guys work with, with, with the broader community, I guess, as well? Well, it's always been, with our relationship with Blacktown Council, uh, which has been good, and the Blacktown Arts Centre in particular have worked closely with community over a long period of time. And so it was through the organisational level that we um, engaged with the other than the Aboriginal um, populations in the space. Yeah. So, um, I think it's fair to say that town council thought they were getting it back <laughs> for a really long time, um, but um, their their generosity in terms of their willingness to work with us under the realities of the site, in terms of stormwater, um, what is it called, um, where you you know looking after the stormwater and making sure, but bringing the site back to a um, a closer interpretation of what it would have been like and the site is prone to flooding there's all sorts of dimensions to the site that uh, are, um, could be seen as um, problematic but um, they also bring up various um, beauties um, like flooding and and the return of um, uh, the, the, the waterways and the um, uh, kangaroos and uh, local areas. So we are seeing it already starting to um, regenerate in its own space. Um, it's a question of how we um, uh, step by step proceed through that because it all can't be done at once. I think also in terms of if you're asking about the local community who aren't Aboriginal, who did because there are houses that back onto it, um, things like the artist camp we didn't stop non-Aboriginal people from coming and they were always uh, notified about this on this weekend, this is what's happening on this land and a bit of the story. And on before we had our hand over, there was a big letter drop in the area about this is what's happening on this land and this is what, what it's about. This is the story it's being handed back to the Darug people and inviting residents to come, come and join us. This is when we're starting. If you want to come along and see and I actually spoke to a few residents who turned up on the night that we were having the handover and asked questions about, so what's happening? Like I've lived here for however many years. And what's going on? And sharing our story and for them to, you know, even be invited towards the end to dance in the dance circle or, you know, go come through the smoke. Um, so we have done our best to also um, keep the wider community, I guess, educated about what's happening, informed probably better is a better word than educated, but informed at least um, about what's happening on that space and what that space actually is, because there's a fence up, but there's no signs about what what happened inside that fence. No? That fence is on the archaeological, around the archaeological section, and that's been fenced off because originally it was fenced off because it had asbestos inside there, another one of the challenges that the site presents. Um, however, that has been um, 
repatriated, what's the word? Um, Thank you, remediated. And, um, um, and so that's not an issue for us, but um, the lead in the paint from the, from the times when the buildings were, were using lead. So that's why the barbed wire fence is there, cyclone fence. However, um, we are hoping that um, we can, the best way for remediation is to um, uh, cover it with a clear material and then we hope to build a cultural centre around that so that while the archaeology is still critical um, and spiritually really important, we can still engage around it and still see it. And the other thing we've started to do, and we've probably been doing a little longer, but we've started to do more so is um, working with people from Blacktown Council and actually having meetings and bringing them out onto site and sitting with them and talking about our connection there and what it means because they work and live in the area and have no idea. But because we're working with them, whether they're working for stormwater or design or whatever, we recently had a meeting out there with quite a, it was a lunch group of people really that came out on site and we walked them around and talked about that the significance so that they could, you know, and if you take five minutes, you can feel the energy out there, you know, you get, you can't go out there and not be somehow connected or impacted or, you know, get a feeling from it, so that's another way. And, you know, they live in the community, so they're going to go back and talk to their families, hopefully, and, and say, oh, well, we went out and spoke to these people, and this is what, how this weird thing happened to me, <laughs> Thank you.